have uh, from, from the Department of New York State. She's out there working hard, Diane Perna, Vietnam era veteran. From the Department of Massachusetts, we have Frank Whitten, our past department commander, most recent, and a Vietnam Navy submariner. And uh, from the Department of Pennsylvania, Wayne Stratus, uh, Vietnam veteran, and uh, up here at the panel, the, the, the table to my right, we have Dr. Veronica Keys. She's with the DPAA in Hawaii. She's going to have remarks for us later. And next to her is uh, the principal director of DPAA, uh, Fern Sumter Wimbush. And uh, we're very glad to have her back again this year. Uh, I think uh, we're going to start with the pledge. Please uh, follow Please all rise. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. And we're going to have uh, Diane Perna with a prayer. Please remain standing. Okay, I was going to say uncovered, but I see the majority of us already have. Lord, please bless everyone here today as we gather to address the actions and the results of retrieving our missing in action soldiers as we have vowed to never leave a veteran behind. We ask you to bless all members and loved ones that are still waiting for the return of their soldiers. Continue to guide and bless the DPAA and all those that who continue to search, retrieve, and identify all the remains of the soldiers that are returned to us so the family members and loved ones can lay their soldiers to rest alongside all other fellow soldiers and heroes. For the family members, provide solace in the, solace in the knowing and knowing that the DPAA and the DAV will not rest until all our soldiers are returned. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 And uh, you can be seated at this time. Wayne Stratus will be our DAA mission statement. statement. We try to live up to that. Uh, at this time, I want to tell you some accomplishments of this POWMIA committee this year. We have submitted uh, five resolutions that had been previously submitted, and we also wrote a brand new resolution regarding the POWMIA issue. We also made two suggestions for changes to the ritual, 
And um, um, so what we've heard so far is they have been well received. We think that at every DAV chapter meeting and department meeting, uh, there should be at least some point in the meeting when the question is asked, are there any former POWs in the room? And if there are, they should be recognized for the sacrifices they had to endure, and the brutality and inhumanity they had to suffer. And uh, so that's one suggestion we did. We also suggest that there should be a, at every meeting, there should be a vacant chair with the POW flag draped over it, so that we, we try to remember, and everybody is asked to remember that the POWs that are not here with us. Uh, I would also like to, at this time, uh, the one person on our committee I, I feel to recognize, Justin, Justin Hart is our advisor. Him and Shane Learman, Justin's in the back, and we thank him for his hard work. Now, our committee did a lot, we've accomplished a lot this year, and we couldn't do it unless we have the support from national, and especially our national committee. Could I ask uh, Mr. Dixon to come on forward?
the Mansfield WMIA Accounting Agency in recognition and appreciation for your continued effort, support, and commitment to achieve the fullest possible accounting for United States personnel still held captive, missing, or unaccounted for from all of our nation's war, which includes bringing the remains of our fallen comrades home. Given this day, August the 4th, 2019, by the Disabled American Veterans.
So here's our mission, and again, I'm going to talk fast and move through because I want to get through the video, and I want to get um, Dr. Keyes up here so she can give you the real interesting stuff. This is our mission, and the bottom line is we provide the fullest possible accounting to the families of our lost and missing service members or DOD designated personnel because we do have some civilians still missing. As it starts, this is the video that's going to give you details about how we conduct our mission. And then I'll come back when the video's over. Southeast Asia, 
airlifts on the Korean Peninsula, 16,000 foot mountaintops in the Himalayas, and underwater sites off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And we still continue to search the battlefields of World War II throughout Europe. After a successful recovery, all evidence has been transported to the DPAA laboratories. Once they've arrived in the lab, the painstaking process of identification begins. This is the final step of the mission, leading to the return of an individual. In many of the cases, an important step in the identification process is DNA analysis, which is accomplished by cutting a bone sample that is sent to the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. One of the challenges DPAA faces today is the lack of reference samples from family members of those still unaccounted for. Any person who is a relative of an unaccounted for American is encouraged to contact their service casualty office to ensure there is a DNA reference sample on file for that service member. DPAA makes an identification with all available evidence remains. Artifacts and historical documents point to the same person. The ID process can take anywhere from a few months to several years to complete. Any unresolved cases are kept open with the hope that new evidence will be found or new technologies will be developed to make a future identification possible. Once an American has been identified, there remains a return to their family through the respective service casualty office. They are returned home with full military honors and given the respect they earned through their service and sacrifice for their country. Oh, as a family member of this agency, to me it's doing phenomenal work. And in a very personal way. Because when somebody loses somebody, like my father, and you really don't know what the story is for 70 years, and then you find an agency that knows about him and keeps his, his memory alive, keeps the mission alive to try to find him. It's very meaningful in a very personal way because it means you're not just doing this yourself alone. You have a whole body of people who are concerned about finding your dad and bringing him home. That says something about how we honor our dead, particularly those who have served this nation. Well, I'm very grateful to all of the DPAA and the uh, related agencies, and, uh, the military in general, as uh, they've pursued this in our government, and for our citizens, because they think it's an important enough mission to continue. And the way we value life, and very few nations, very few, I don't think any other nation to this degree does this. Which, you know, makes me proud to be an American. I just wanted to yell to openly to everybody out there, he's home, he's home. I couldn't believe it. And when I went up and touched his name, I thought, you're home, you're home. It's unbelievable. I'm glad I live in the United States of America and that we have this attitude, leave no man behind. We are, we are so fortunate. I want you to know, and I know from my own experience, that if something's happened to you, we will be looking for you. <coughs> the men and women of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency are united in their effort to recover and return as many of our missing personnel as possible. One more patriot return, one more family that now has answers. One more step in fulfilling our nation's promise. So I still have not lost my skill set as a military intelligence officer and I have way too many slides in my briefing that I have time. So I'm going to flip through a number of these and just jump to the highlights because I really want you to hear from Dr. Keyes. The bottom line takeaway from this slide is 82,000 missing, daunting. We have over the past couple of years 
been able to increase our number, number of accountings to over 200, which is what <coughs> Congress asked us to do. But at the end of the day, because many of our losses are either deep sea or high aircraft crashes, we only expect to be able to identify or recover and account for about 38,000. Here are all the locations that we plan to go to in um, FY19, which is this year. There's a big question mark on the bottom right-hand side of that slide for North Korea. As many of you know, we have not had an opportunity to conduct our missions as we thought we would following the two summits held by the President and Chairman Kim. Unfortunately, due to the time frame of having to establish logistics, um, fund all of the, the teams, and fund all of the logistics, we can no longer um, do any uh, North Korean operations in this FY, because the FY ends at the end of September. So what we are doing now is we have our plan on the shelf. We are waiting for the uh, North Korean People's Army to get back in contact with us and hopefully agree to sit down so that we can have a discussion. Stay tuned. Uh, if you hear um, the conversation, that's good. If the conversation ceases and we haven't announced that we're going to conduct operations by April of next year, then that means that we weren't able to come to an agreement and the North Koreans won't let us in. So we continue the message to them and we're hopeful that they will um, come back soon. Here are our priorities. I'm going to skip past this. The bottom line is the Vietnam War remains our priority, priority because of a, a number of issues like aging witnesses, dying witnesses, acidic soil, etc. I want to talk a little bit about Korean War accounting. Uh, Dr. Keyes is going to do the, the rest of the main uh, details of what she experienced. But the bottom line is the 55 boxes that came back, we just identified our eighth individual. And in the next two to three weeks, so we told the families this Thursday and Friday, so I'm not telling you anything. I'm not tipping like I did last year. <laughs> um, we are about to announce 25 more from that. Now, that sounds like a lot, thank you. That sounds like a lot, but what we've also uh, determined is there are probably over two, about 250 people represented in those 55 boxes, 170 of which we believe are U.S., and then the 80 are non-U.S. So watch this lane, and we will, we will continue to move forward with those accounting. We have full authority to do the negotiations with the North, both the Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo, and the National Security Council and the White House have told us that um, everybody is committed to keeping this on a separate track from the DNUC um, issue. We continue to do everything in our power to keep it separate, but it seems like the messaging keeps trying to pull it together and associate one with <laughs> the other. But from our standpoint, we continue in this humanitarian effort. Lastly, the announcement that I made last year where I talked about a project that we were uh, moving forward that I couldn't tell you the details because we had to tell the families, well, that's the 652 disinterment project, uh, disinterment plan that we have established and uh, gotten approval for to disinter 652 Korean War um, unknowns out of the punch bowl. It's a seven-phase pro uh, project. We just completed phase one, and we're now, which, which consisted of 73 disinterments, and we're now into phase two. It's going to take us anywhere from five to seven years to disinter all of those bodies for a lot of reasons, because you know, we can't tear up the, the memorial or the, the cemetery. And so we are working with the cemetery to, to get um, at least eight disinterments a month during the fiscal year. So that's moving up, uh, along, along nicely. This is... Um, Master Sergeant McDaniels, he was the first Korean War serviceman identified out of the K-55 project, the 55 boxes. What was really interesting is, first of all, you saw his sons in the video. They were the two gentlemen that had the ID uh, tag, dog tag. That ID tag was in one of the boxes, and so we kind of suspected that he might be there. And then, of course, we looked for him in those 55, and he was definitely there. Another individual that was, the second one identified was PFC Jones, and I'd like to talk about him because our lead um, for the Korean War Identification Project, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jenny Jin, told me that when they opened the boxes and they saw a particular set of remains, she said, I knew exactly 
that it was PFC Jones. She had to wait for the DNA to bear it out, but the reason she knew was because PFC Jones was like 6'8", or some really, he was really, really tall, and so the bone, she said there was nobody else that could be but him. So really interesting. <coughs> Again, Vietnam is our priority, but we continue with World War II accounting as well. Much of the World War II identifications have come from disinterments. We continue to work with the U.S.-Russia Joint Commission to, to deal with the losses that we believe um, the Russians have information on in their archives, as well as working with China. Again, I'm going to be moving pretty fast. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tech Sergeant Kibbe in the upper left-hand corner. He is in Hawaii picking up the remains of his grandfather. Really, really awesome. And so that young man had an opportunity to come to Hawaii and, frankly, meet his grandfather for the first time. Developments of note in the top right portion of the slide is a picture of Miss Marla Andrews. She is the daughter of Tuskegee Airman Captain Lawrence Dixon. The reason why this is significant is because Captain Dixon was the first of the 27 Tuskegee Airmen that are missing that we identified. We identified him last year. We did not do it on our own. We had a number of partners that helped us out to include the University of Austria, the, Austria, the University of Innsbruck, the um, National World War II Museum in New Orleans, as well as a private um, researcher in Austria helped us recover that. Um, first of the 27 Tuskegee Airmen. I'm going to leave Isotope off because she's going to talk about it. And then lastly, if you have an opportunity, Google the Tulsa American last B-24. Um, PBS did a documentary on our mission. It's very, very exciting. And I'm going to leave you in suspense. In the interest of time, yeah, I'm going to leave you in suspense. You're going to have to go watch the documentary to see what it's all about. Again, I talked a, lot, a little bit about partnerships. We are growing our partnering effort immensely with a budget, what we would call a paltry budget of just $160 million. You, you, you would think that um, it would likely cost a lot more than that, and it does. And so what we've done is we've invested in partners. So we work with universities, private organizations, private individuals to help us. And what we found is not only do we increase our expertise, but where we are unable to get more people, meaning internal to our agency, we're now able to outsource a lot of the uh, research, investigation, and excavation. We do not outsource the uh, identification piece to external labs, and that's largely because our lab is accredited, we have a standard, and frankly, our director and I have to be very confident that when our medical examiner signs that piece of paper, he is adhering to all the standards that we put in place, and so we can trust that identification as being true. This is just a map of where all of our partners, partners are. Here's by country, so we're worldwide. Outreach, I'm here. <laughs> the the right-hand side of the slide is a poster. There's a couple of boxes of these posters back there. I invite you to take them back to your organizations. It's really good to hand out for the um, National POW MIA Recognition Day in September. This poster was designed by a staff sergeant in the PAA. I'm going to skip that. I'll skip that. And then final thoughts. So again, I want to thank the DAV. What I didn't mention up front is that the DAV sponsored two family meetings for us. One of them was a family member update in San Jose. <laughs> And the other one was, the, was a government meeting hosted by the National League of Families. We thank you so much for that gift. Uh, you know, our, we like to use our money to do operations and we get in the field. And so whenever we have an organization that gives us funds, we give it to the families. So thank you so much. And I'm, we're not going to do any shake hands, but come on, Dr. Keys. Your turn. <laughs>
basically what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is the identification process from the laboratory side. So as um, Ms. Sumter-Winbush mentioned, I am a forensic anthropologist and forensic archaeologist at the DPA laboratory uh, in Hawaii. And so I participate in a lot of the steps of the identification process, but I, my main role is in the Korean War identification project. Um, so she mentioned I, I went to North Korea as part of the team that recovered those uh, 55 boxes of remains, and I work a lot with the identification of those remains and also uh, Korean War service members that we disinter from the punch bowl um, and other sources. So that's my main role, but I also work in, um, in the field, so I do uh, recovery missions and I do other types of analysis in the lab. So um, I would be happy to answer your questions as I'm talking, because I'd like to talk about things you're interested in. So if there's anything you want to ask, feel free to ask as I'm, as I'm going along, and I think we'll also have some time at the end for questions. So I'm going to kind of just start at the beginning and go through the end of the identification, um, talk a little bit about how evidence gets into the lab, and then the different methods that we use in the lab to do our analysis, and then um, I have a little case study that we can kind of walk through to show the whole process. So we receive evidence into the lab in several ways. Um, the three main ways that we get evidence are doing field recoveries. So these would be excavation of sites um, where we believe there was either a, a plane crash, a burial, or some location where we believe there are remains of a missing service member. We also accept evidence uh, that is turned over to us. Sometimes this can be from a, a local, like while we're on site doing a recovery. Um, we might interview a, a local um, who knows of some remains that someone has had in the family, or, and they'll turn those over to us, um, or turn over identification tags and things like that. So we'll accept evidence from people. This can also be um, a government-to-government -government thing, like the North Korean turnover. The North Korean government turns over remains to us, and we will accept them and accession them into the lab. And we also do a lot of disinterments of uh, remains that have been buried in various cemeteries that were not able to be identified at the time, and then as we um, do research and we feel like we have a good idea of who this might be, we listen to those remains, bring them into the lab, and then we do our analysis so we can identify them. So I'll talk about each one of these a little bit more. Um, so the field recovery is a, is a big part of our operation, and we use um, well-trained and experienced archaeologists to lead those recoveries. Because when we are doing um, an excavation of a site, we can only do it one time. So we are destroying that site as we do this excavation. So we use well-trained um, archaeologists to, to manage those so that we know that we're doing it properly. We document everything um, so that we have a record of what we've done. So if anyone else can go and refer to those documents and see um, the results of that excavation. Um, and that training. Um, we take that to the field and we're able to look at um, the relationships between where evidence might be, um, how a site was formed, so the things that have happened in that location since that incident to help us um, pinpoint where we have the best chance of recovering evidence, and then um, also between the evidence and that site. So we excavate sites in a variety of contexts. Some of them are underwater, some of them are on mountain slopes. Um, some of them are you know, in just a lot of different contexts. So we take that experience and so that we can do the best excavation and make sure that if there's any evidence there to be recovered, we will get it. And if we walk away from that site and we didn't find anything, we also have high confidence that it's because it wasn't there, not because we missed it. Um, so this is a, a profile of a, uh, an excavation unit in, at a site. So the ground surface is, is up there where that orange level is. And then this is the bottom of the unit. And this is what we call a soil profile. So part of what we are able to do is look at this profile and get an idea of what might have been going on at this site. Um, so there's some different um, stratigraphic layers, so these different layers of, of sediment. And then we can look for different features, like where things might have been disturbed, um, where we're finding bits of evidence that are related to the incident that we're um, interested in. So, you know, like pieces of plane wreckage or other things that we know 
would be the material that we're interested in. Um, and so all of that is part of our job as the recovery um, leader to, to then direct the team as to how we should be excavating that. Uh, some of the sites are also burial features. Um, so these sites aren't spread over a large area, but we're trying to find one particular area where someone may have been buried. And there are distinct, um, sometimes you can see in the soil that something has been disturbed, just the color is a little bit different. So in this slide, um, that area in the middle is a little more, um, there's some lighter colored soil with some dark modeling and it looks different than the soil around it. Um, and, it and once we excavated that, we did find mm. that was a burial feature and that the difference in that soil color, we were able to determine that that's where it was. Um, but it's not always that obvious and sometimes it does require someone with training to, to be able to um, interpret those things. Um, as I mentioned, these sites are in a lot of different contexts, so we use a lot of different tools depending on the situation um, that we're in. So in the top left, um, they're using an excavator, and that is not a very um, fine-tuned type of tool. <laughs> so you would use something like that where you know that you know, maybe you're um, near a river or somewhere where there's a lot of soil being laid down annually, and you know you've got a meter of soil before you're going to get to the level that you're, you're interested in, so when, when that crash occurred. So instead of having to dig that whole top overburden by hand, we would bring in an excavator and get down close to the, the layer that we're looking for, and then that is, is more efficient for our team. On the top right, that's a, an underwater site. Um, I'm not an underwater archaeologist, but we have teams um, that, um, based on research, they know that a uh, plane has gone down in a certain area, and they use certified divers to go and um, recover evidence. And we've made several identifications from underwater uh, plane crash sites. In the bottom left is a team using hand tools to excavate. So this, yeah. Uh, when you recover a body, uh, how do you discern whether the gender of the person? I will get to that. Okay. We, will, we will get to that. Yes, that's a good question. Um, and if, when I get there, if I haven't answered it to your satisfaction, we can talk about it. Um, we use a lot of hand tools, shovels, um, picks, like if we have like roots or, or lots of large rocks in the soil. Um, and then everything on the bottom right that shows our screening. So all of this soil then has to be screened because some of this evidence is very small. And so it's all run through um, mesh screens so that we don't miss anything. Um, we also bring these remains through turnovers. This photo is the um, repatriation ceremony at Hickam for the 55 boxes that we refer to as the K-55 that we got from North Korea. Um, so these remains are given to us in, a very, in various situations. And the biggest challenge with turnovers is that we don't have all of that information about where these remains came from, like we do if we conduct that excavation ourselves. So a lot of times um, we, we have um, some information on where the person or organization that gave it to us says they came from, but we don't really have extensive documentation about how it was recovered, when it was recovered, and so a lot of that, um, it makes it a lot more challenging to do analysis on these remains because some of it isn't reliable, you know, people misremember things, people misremember where things came from, um, and so that makes our job a lot harder when we get into the laboratory. But we still um, have a lot of success identifying individuals from turned over remains. And if you, if you would like me to tell you my little anecdotes about going to North Korea, and if you're interested in hearing that, I can do that now, or we can do that at the end. But this was um, really an amazing honor. Because there were four of us from the laboratory that went to North Korea. Um, it was about a year ago, so we went on July 27th of last year. And we flew in on a C-17 to the airport in Wonsan, North Korea, and we were there on the ground for about three hours, and all of the remains had been laid out, so we had like, sent ahead um, boxes and packing material. Everything was laid out, and we did a review right there on the ground to make sure that what we were accepting was, in fact, human remains, um, which, which they were, 
and there was also some material evidence, including Master Sergeant McDaniel's ID tag. So it was the only ID tag we had, but that obviously corresponded to a missing soldier. And um, there was also some other equipment, um, helmets, and other other materials that were consistent with military issue gear, U.S. military gear. So we knew that it was likely our guys, and it was human. And so we then took all of, all of those remains back to South Korea, to the Osan Air Base. And we had about three days on the ground there. And we documented everything, and then transferred them into cases that were draped with the U.S. flag, and then were flown back on two C-17s to Hickam, uh, where we had the ceremony at the other end. So I, I also had the privilege to escort one of the C-17s back for the ceremony. Um, and then everything came into the lab, and we began our um, analysis in the lab. So, uh, as Ms. Sumter mentioned, we've made eight identifications. We've got another 25 that will be announced over the next few weeks. Um, and then we have several more in the works. So, come, going into the next fiscal year, we will continue to make identifications from this assemblage. Um, so, that was, that was a pretty, pretty amazing thing. So, those 55 boxes all come from the same location, or they are No, so, they, so this, this is one of the issues with the loss of context that we have. We were given um, some documentation on where these boxes came from, but obviously we didn't participate in the recovery, so we just had what we were told by the North Koreans. But it is turning out that that is accurate, so the people that we are identifying um, were lost in the area where these boxes um, reportedly came from. And there were two major areas, most of them were from um, East Chosen Reservoir area, and then that was 35 boxes, and then the other 20 boxes were from the Utan area. So two of the major battle, battle areas. Um, we also work with a lot of disinterment. So for the Korean War, um, all of those unknowns are buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, or Punch Bowl Cemetery. And we now have gotten approval to disinter the remaining 650 unknowns that are buried there. So the product that I work on, we also manage all those cases. Um, the pace has been about eight every two, every two weeks. Twice a month, we get eight disinterments from the Punch Bowl. And then we do an assessment of those, and then we defer them all out for the appropriate testing. Um, and there are also uh, cemeteries all over the world. Um, we have projects that work with remains that were disinterred from World War II cemeteries in the Philippines and other places. Um, so those remains also come into our laboratory. And then we have some historical documentation about when those were initially buried, where they came from, and um, anything else that might help us uh, with our identification. <coughs> Yes. So that punch bowl is that's the uh, specific mm -hmm. burial. Yeah. Yeah. This photo is from one of our disinterment ceremonies. Yeah. In some of these cases, do you guys use that ground penetration radar? We have used that in some. Um, so if we, um, for a lot of the like, if it was a burial and we have to kind of pinpoint that location. We can use ground penetrating radar to look for any disturbances uh, below the ground that aren't visible by the naked eye, and then we can kind of focus our efforts <coughs> investigating those anomalies instead of just digging everywhere. Question one, uh, return to the remains from Korea. Is there a possibility or if there, is there a system they might be able to utilize some of these remains uh, possibly were listed as last known lives with corroboration of other people who were with them at the time. And if some of them were remains that might have been exhumed from prison camps. So in this group, um, none of those remains came from any POW camps. So these were all battle, battlefield losses. Um, and so far, that has actually that has been answered. So no, no last known lives in. Okay. So once we get evidence into the laboratory, we have a variety of um, testing methods that we use to determine who uh, those remains might be. 
Uh, as Ms. Sumter Windbush mentioned, our laboratory is located in two, two uh, places. Our main laboratory is on Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, and then we also have a laboratory at Office, uh, Air Force, Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Both of these locations are accredited, so again, we know that we have, we can have high confidence in the results that come off our laboratory. We also have a lab at um, Wright-Patterson. They do a lot of our life support analysis of like um, plane wreckage and plane uh, evidence from plane. So the first line of evidence that we use is historical research. So we have a team of historians and researchers that have compiled information on a lot of these incidents. So if we know that we have recovered evidence from a particular location, we can use that to narrow down uh, how many people have been lost in that area and who could be a, a likely candidate for a match to that evidence. So in this example, um, this is a World War II site in Belgium uh, with 73,000 individuals unaccounted for from World War II, but in that area, there were only so many P-47 crashes, so we know that there's only so many people who are likely to be a match for these remains we find them at that site. Uh, we often recover material evidence. Um, this could be personal effects, it could be issued gear, um, and we can use that <coughs> circumstantial evidence to help build an identification. So in this example here, this was a wristwatch. We were able to determine the make of that watch and there was a photograph of an individual wearing that watch. And so that helps us when we're, we're trying to build a case that it is, that the remains are a particular individual, and we can link that to a person. And also, we can then return that to the family. So the family would receive any evidence that we could tie to a particular individual um, when, the, when the identification is made. Um, and, anthropological analysis, so uh, with any human remains, we will try to create a profile um, of those remains so that we can then compare that to any information we have on file for the service members. So we try to establish sex, age, ancestry, the stature of the individual, um, any trauma that might have taken place, or anything else individuating that we can then use to, to um, determine which individual this might be. Um, a lot of the assemblages of remains that we receive have been commingled, so that means remains from multiple individuals have been mixed together. And so we also try to, we have to determine which remains are one person. Um, and we can use some of these uh, characteristics to determine that. So if we have two skeletal elements and one appears to be from a much older individual than another, we can use that to, to distinguish them from each other. Mm -hmm. um, if they, they one is much larger or smaller or they just don't, don't look consistent, then we can um, segregate those individuals out. And then we use the records that we have on file and this historical data so we know where they came from, we know the information about the individuals, and then we can compare those to see who is consistent with the information we get from the remains. Um, your question was about sex. How do we tell the sex? So um, the areas of the skeleton that are most useful to determine sex are your skull and your pelvis. So there are features in the skull um, Males tend to be more robust, they have more robust muscle attachments. So we can look at those features and determine whether or not it's likely that the individual is male. Um, and also, uh, there's a lot of morphology in the pelvis that is very distinctive between males and females, and so we can look at those areas. If we don't have a skull or, or any pelvic bones, um, men are generally just larger, um, so we can look at, we can measure like the lengths of bones and then the probability that if something measures over a certain threshold, it's more likely to be male. Um, so depending on what remains we have, 
um, we have methods that are more or less accurate, but um, and, and if we don't have anything that is reliable, then we would just say indeterminate. Um, we also have a team of forensic dentists who, if we receive dental remains, can create a postmortem chart of those remains that we can then also compare to dental records that we have on files for individuals. Um, they also um, take radiographs of any dental remains. And uh, as anthropologists, we can also use some of those radiographs to determine the age of people, so your teeth develop at a pretty predictable rate. Um, and most of these guys, unfortunately, are still quite young, so we can use their dental development to come up with an age range for them. And then if we happen to have any anti-mortem x-rays on file, we can compare those, and that can be just as unique as a, as a fingerprint. So if we have an x-ray on file for a service member and we can match it to the remains, then that's a positive ID. We also have developed a method in the laboratory to look at radiographs of your clavicles and upper vertebrae um, a lot of service members have induction radiographs to clear them for tuberculosis. So these were taken when they were inducted into the, the service, and a lot of those are still on file. So we have those, and we've digitized them all, and we can take x-rays of the, the skeletal remains and then compare those to those um, x-rays. And that's another, that would be considered a positive ID. So if we're able to compare those radiographs and there's enough features that match. So this on the bottom is um, an example from one of our reports where an analyst will describe every place that they see something in common with an anti-mortem x-ray. Um, and then that report would go in the identification packet to um, ID someone. And then, as Ms. Fern sumter Windwish mentioned, we are now developing an isotope testing laboratory within uh, DPAA. I am not an isotope specialist, so I'm going to give you the like, 101 version of this. But basically, as we consume water and food, um, our bones record these different isotopes. Um, and we can then measure that and figure out what type of diet someone was eating, generally speaking, and um, also sometimes some geographic information. So the water that you drink from a different area will have different ratios of oxygen isotopes, and we can then use that to kind of exclude people from a set of remains. So, for example, uh, in the K55 boxes, we have approximately 80 individuals that we believe are not U.S. service members. Uh, many of them we believe are probably uh, rock forces that we're fighting with our units, but using isotope analysis, we can kind of distinguish between a more Eastern style diet where someone was eating more rice and vegetables versus a Western diet where it leans more heavily toward corn and meat consumption. And so we were able to use this, we kind of did a pilot study with the K55 um, to separate those groups out and then we prioritized the DNA testing on the samples that were more likely to be US. So it, we're using it as a tool to kind of uh, manage our resources, the DNA lab can only do so many tests. So this way we can kind of prioritize the ones that we believe are more likely to be our guys. Yes. So two questions. One is, do we know approximately how many sets of remains in the 55 total? 250. 250. So based on DNA, anthropological analysis, isotope testing, we think there's about 250. And then based on that, these 80 that we think are rock, what are we doing with the Korea, Korean government to be able to help and, and deal with their missing? So we have a kind of a counterpart organization in South Korea called MACRI, and we work very closely with them in these sorts of situations. So we have sampled all of the remains for DNA testing, um, and if we believe that they are likely to be one of their missing service members, then we will share that data with them, and then they can compare it against their own database of um, family reference samples for their service members. So, and we have done repatriations with them, so if we have um, our gay soldiers, they will be repatriated to South Korea. I think last September we, we repatriated 64 individuals to them. So. By the way, there are three or four vacant seats up here now. There's people in the hallway. We have three or four seats in the room. 
Um, so yeah, so the isotope analysis is not uh, discriminating enough that we can use for positive ID, but it does help us kind of um, separate out two groups. And, and that makes other analyses we can do it faster and use our resources better. Uh, DNA testing, which I was just mentioning, we um, have a good partnership with the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Systems DNA Identification Lab, which is located at Dover. Um, and we, they do all of our DNA testing. So we will cut the samples, and then we send them to them. They also maintain the database of all the family reference samples. So all current active duty service members have their own DNA on file. But for Pasta County, this, this wasn't a thing. So we don't have um, self-DNA references for any of these individuals. So what the, um, the DNA lab has done is pursued family reference samples for all of the missing service members. So um, they, they begin with mitochondrial DNA testing. I won't get too technical because you know, this can get really um, confusing. Again, I'm not a DNA analyst. But mitochondrial DNA is passed down maternally. So I share the same mitochondrial DNA as my mother, and my son also shares my mitochondrial DNA. Exactly. They're an exact copy. Um, but that means it's also not unique to you. So everyone in your maternal line will have the same mitochondrial DNA. Um, that is the first line of testing, because usually with past remains, um, the DNA can be degraded, and you have a lot more copies of mitochondria in your cells than you do nuclear DNA. So you only have one copy of nuclear DNA, and so they're able to get that to sequence um, more successfully. And then we can compare that to those family reference samples, and then we can narrow down the pool of who it might be. Um, some of these sequences are really common. We, we have one sequence for the Korean War um, assemblage that has like 400 guys, the same mitochondrial DNA. So it gets us down to 400 guys, but we still have to figure out which one of those 400 guys it is. So that is when we use nuclear testing. But again, since we don't have a self-reference, it's still kind of a statistical game. So I have a sister. The likelihood that me and my sister share a good portion of our nuclear DNA is higher than me sharing with, with a person that I'm not related to. So we can run those tests on the sample we get from the remains and the sample we get from another family member and come up with a likelihood, how, how likely is it that these two people are related. So in some cases, those statistics are in the billions. I think we just had one from the K55 that the people at Aftil, that's the DNA lab, said they had never seen it was like four nonillion, which is like 10 to the 20th something. Um, so it can get really, I mean, there's only eight or nine billion people on the earth, so we were pretty sure it was the guy. Uh, but we have to use these, kind of build these things on each other in order to get down to, to the place where we can say it's only this one person. And then we use all these different lines of evidence together to make the identification. So after we've done all of these different types of testing, um, all of these lines of evidence need to point to the same person. So once we have overwhelming evidence that these remains are associated to this one person and we can reasonably exclude every other one else, then we make that ID. And then a whole package of reports is put together showing all these different types of testing and why we are confident that it is that person. So now I'm just going to do a little case study. This one is a Korean War case. Um, and just to kind of show you from beginning to end how this works. This is a, an actual case. So there's no, nothing um, in the person has been identified, but I don't think there's any kind of identifying information in here. Um, so just to briefly talk about the different types of identification, I mentioned positive identification. That means we can say this is one particular person. We also have situations where we can't make an individual ID, we can make a group ID. So for example, a plane crash, and we know there were four people missing from that plane crash. So we might recover remains, and we aren't able to determine who it is, but we know it's one of these four people. We can make a group identification of of the four missing people from that incident. Um, I am actually not aware of any case where we've ever made a circumstantial ID. There could also be a situation where, based on circumstantial evidence, 
we can identify the individual, but we can't call it positive ID because we, we don't have um, the right kind of evidence to say that. And then we also have situations where we get additional portions of an individual who has already been identified. So in that 250 individuals from that K55, we believe there's probably about 20 individuals represented that we've already ID'd. So in that case, um, depending on the wishes of the next of kin, so when they get notified, there's a form that they fill out saying, yes, I would like to be notified if you find additional remains of my family member, or no, I do not wish to be notified, and then we act according to their wishes if we find additional portions. But we, we do the analysis, and we don't know beforehand if it's someone we've already ID'd. So once we have identified that it is someone that person's already been accounted for, then um, we just check our documentation and see what the family wanted to do. Um, identification, the timeline can really vary depending on the quality of the evidence we have um, and the different types of testing we can do. If we have enough evidence that we're able to identify a person, we do so immediately. We don't wait to see if we might get more remains. We ID what we have as soon as we can because we want families to know. Um, if we don't have enough data, we don't have enough evidence to say that we can't say who it is, then we pursue other lines of testing. So if we have DNA results, but we don't have a DNA reference, then we will go to the service casualty offices and ask them to look for someone, you know, we think it might be this guy, but we don't have a DNA reference. Can you see if there's anyone in their family that can jump? Um, so we will keep working it to see if we can find more evidence. And then we just constantly revisit those cases every so often and see if anything's changed, if we've come up with a new line of testing, if we've gotten in more evidence, and then until we get back to we've made an ID. So that's kind of our process. Uh, so in this example, uh, the number of individuals that are still unaccounted for from the Korean War is about 7,650. We're probably down in the 7640s now, so we made a few more IDs. Um, but so that, that's a large pool of people. And this is kind of how we get down to one person. Um, so we have a lot of historical data. Um, in this particular case, this was a field recovery. So for a period of time, uh, from about 1996 <coughs> to 2005, we were sending teams into North Korea to do field recovery. So in this situation, in this case, we knew that there was a period of time where these companies were engaged in the area. And we had 63 individuals still missing from that incident. So at this site, based on the location of the site where we were excavating, we knew the kind of the pool of people that went missing in that area. So that brings us down to that number of 63. As our team was doing the recovery, because we carefully document everything and every step of the process, when we got down to the remains, we could see the orientation of the remains in the ground, so how they were likely buried at the time of the incident. There were two individuals at the site. Um, the site was in a field, in an agricultural field. So this is a uh, drawing of that, the positioning of those remains in the field. And as you can see, there appears to be the legs of a second individual above the individual on the bottom. So we could tell that there were two people. The remains on the top had probably been disturbed from that agricultural activity because they were closer to the surface. Um, but the, the um, individual on the bottom was face down, and, the, and his, his arms were kind of placed just haphazardly. And so the positioning of the bodies indicated that they were not buried by friendly forces. So we would not have, our own, our own people would not have buried them this way. So just based on the arrangement of the remains, we have 63 people missing. 42 of those individuals were found buried by UN forces. Probably not those 41 guys, because they wouldn't have been buried like this. So there's 21 people missing in that area who could have been found and buried by the North Korean or Chinese forces. So 
from this point on, we're talking about the set of remains on the, on the bottom, the more complete set of remains. So we were able to establish a biological profile for that individual. We determined that it was a male. We were able to determine that the person was of African descent and that they were between 17 and 19 years old. And we measured bones and we determined they were about 68 and a half inches tall. Usually we have a range, maybe a five, five inches on either side, just so that when we're narrowing down those groups, we don't miss anybody. Because, you know, these guys are still growing a lot of time. So of those 21 people, there were only six people who fit that profile. So now we're down to a much smaller group of people. Um, the dentists did an analysis of the dental remains. They observed a large cavity on that right upper molar and a large cavity on the lower right first molar. Um, the, this individual's upper third molars had not erupted, so they would not have been visible in his mouth. And, but the lower molars were, third molars were erupted. And so by comparing this postmortem dental chart to the charts of those six individuals, there was only one guy whose um, dentition matched what we saw in the remains. So he had charted an upper right first and a lower right first molar cavity. Upper third molars were not visible, so weren't marked, and then the lowers were present. So that gives us one guy. <clears throat> and then we also used a letter from his um, personnel file from his mother saying that he had a large gap between his front teeth, which we observed in the remains. Um, it's called diastema, it's a technical term. So we had recorded this in our analysis, and then when we checked the records of that one individual, it was also noted by his, his mother that that was present. So we were able to make that ID of that, that person without using DNA in this case, because we just had enough evidence that it could only be this one person. So, just to kind of summarize, we, in the laboratory, um, rely very heavily on all of our other directorates, and we get a lot of support from them. So this is definitely um, an effort that is across our agency, from logistics to research, um, all comes together to support the work that we do in the laboratory. And we try to use all evidence that is available to us so that we can make the identification. And in the past year, 2018 fiscal year, we had 207 IDs, which I think was a record for us. Um, and I think this year we're on pace to at least meet that goal. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. How many sets of remains do you have now that are identified? I don't know what the, the holding on the lab is currently. Um, you know, because we're always working cases and taking new cases. Um, the Korean War identification project has a pretty large assemblage of remains. That's the one I can speak to most. Um, we we had a turnover similar to the, the K55 in the early 90s, where we received 208 boxes. And we've made um, over 300 IDs out of those boxes, but we still are working you know, those cases, like I mentioned, that we couldn't get to an ID. So we have that assemblage, um, and then we now are working on those determinants. But there's a good amount of casework that's always going on. Yeah. When you give the numbers for Vietnam, that that also include the ones were in Cambodia. Is that included into that? <coughs> yeah. So yeah, no matter where they were lost, anyone from that conflict is okay. <coughs> in Vietnam, they made a lot of tunnels. Are, do you have maps of those tunnels that you can investigate in Vietnam? <coughs> no. Historian researcher question. No. I don't personally know. <coughs> Are there other countries that have departments like yours that are working that you get information from? Um, the, the country with the, the level of operations that closely approaches ours would be South Korea. Oh, okay. And their agency is modeled on our agency. We work very closely with them. Um, I know that we have, um, we exchange information with other countries, but I don't think there's any other country that so like not the European countries? Um, so we have been in contact with several other countries and 
upset sent forces to Korea, and uh, I mostly only really know about uh, our engagement with them takes us to Korea more samples, but we'll have situations where we have a set of remains that doesn't appear to be a, pers a person of Asian descent, but doesn't seem to match any of our guys. So we have reached out to them so that we can exclude them. We think this might be an Australian or a Canadian or a British soldier. We need some information from you to, to, so that we can exclude him or repatriate him or whatever. So we do need something. But they're not actively pursuing like we are. I don't think so. But I think that that's starting there's starting to be some interest in doing that. Okay. Yes. I have a question. World War One issues, they still find their bodies. Do you guys have anything to do with those people? World War I cases, we don't actively pursue. Our mandate is World War II and, and a past. But if we were to encounter or receive remains in World War I, we would accept them. You get good cooperation from the Vietnamese government, the Cambodian government, Laotian, China? Um, I think we have pretty good cooperation with Vietnam and Laos. <coughs> Cambodia, we go into Cambodia. Um, Yes. And we go into China, but I think yes. we have a, a well-established relationship with Vietnam and Laos. And I think we're still working on it. So I know you, you probably heard about the sanctions that Cambodia put on the U.S. Uh, last year, actually 18 months ago. They have since lifted those sanctions, and now our teams are able to go back into Cambodia. So we're doing that. Um, with China, what we're really interested in in China right now are, is the archives. We need to get into their archives to get their records so we can look. But we have had the ability to send teams in. We just haven't been able to do it recently. And so hopefully in FY20, uh, we'll be able to do some, some work in China. Uh, with regards to our cooperation, to get to a little bit more to your question, uh, in addition to Australia, we also work closely with Japan. Many of you that know the history about how Japan goes after their loss and their missing, once they find their remains, they cremate them, right? And so we've been able to get in and have them agree to allow us to take a look at any remains that they believe are not of Asian descent. And so our lab works directly with their lab uh, as well to ensure that they don't cremate any of our, our military. Other than that, um, and of course the Russians, uh, we're working with them with, under the U.S.-Russian Joint Commission getting into their archives. Um, we are no, we are not in the embassy now because we were kicked out because we kicked out there. So they just came. <laughs> but what we did do was we set up a contract vehicle. And so we hired three Russian researchers that we give information to for them to go and find details about losses in their archives. So that mission is still going. And we also have um, a major that's responsible for <clears throat> going into Russia every once in a while to check on those researchers to make sure that they're doing what we've asked them to do. Yeah, I have a question. Um, if, if we're in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we have to hire Russian helicopters in the past to actually go and send the teams in. Is that still the case? Yeah, so, you know, much of the Southeast Asia countries are still um, communist and largely for reasons of safety, which I can respect, they pretty much dictate to us not only the contractor that we can use, but also the type of military aircraft. So we no longer use U.S. carriers, uh, military, because of the sensitivity of appearing like an invasion, right? And so especially in Vietnam, uh, we coordinate very closely right before the beginning of the next fiscal year so that we can let them know how many teams we're going to send in, and they will figure out, we got to pay them, of course, and that's the largest expense, the blade hours for both transport of our teams, but also for medevac. Uh, but they will, they will um, go ahead and help us contract through the contracting, U.S. contracting office in Singapore. So that's, that's how we do that. Yeah, they're communists. Um, you, you, they you search it for remains in Vietnam, Laos, and Korea. French, Germany, and you find remains of an, another soldier from another country, friendly or not, what do you do with those remains? Do so you give them, them to that country? Or? So we don't do field analysis. So if we were to uncover remains, I mean, we would document if, we, if there was something obvious that we suspected, 
wasn't one of ours. Um, and maybe depending on how certain we were that it wasn't a US soldier, we might notify local officials. But generally, and in a lot of countries, there's a review before the remains come back to the US, where local officials and our personnel determine what's going to stay and what's going to come back. Um, but if we got remains back to the lab and then determined that it was someone else's soldier, um, we would definitely contact them at that time. And then depending on you know, their program, their level of interest, we would you know, arrange to repatriate those remains. Yeah. From countries that aren't necessarily friendly to the United States, how well have we done in delinking this from any type of political process? So this is a non-political, just a humanitarian effort. How well have we done in that, and, and how well is that aura working? Yeah, so I'm biased, so I will say we did very well. As an example, last year we, re we repatriated um, a lost service member from Burma, which was pretty awesome. Um, the first in a very, very long time that, well, it was, it was the first that we actually recovered an ID. We had some others turned over, but I just use that as an example as to how the director and the DDO, our deputy director for operations, are engaging at the government level for the countries that we want to go into to have talks, to talk about this humanitarian, and we keep stressing, humanitarian mission um, to recover our, our missing service members. And the fortunate thing is the countries that we deal with understand that, right? Because they also are looking for their missing service members. And their families also are demanding that their government do a better job. So we, we try to stay as far away from um, uh, arms races and you know, denuke uh, initiatives because, again, we are humanitarian. And although we tend to look very military oftentimes, when we go into many of the nations that we're not, as you call it, friendly with, our soldiers don't wear uniforms. Now, we know what our soldiers, you know, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines looks like, so you can tell that they're military. But for the most part, um, you can't tell at a distance that there are military <coughs> personnel on the ground because we try to keep that as far away from our mission as possible. In fact, I didn't get to mention, but I'm leaving tonight to go to three sites in Europe. So I'm really excited about that because I've only been to the Southeast Asia sites, um, Vietnam, Laos, and Cam um, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. But I'm going to um, Poland, the UK, Germany. That's it, right? In a span of seven days. So I hope my back holds up. Yeah. <laughs> I got some. Oh. <laughs>
That didn't happen until this time. You get your roller skates. <laughs> right. You yeah. the yes. <coughs> if you're authorized to do a dig, let's say in Vietnam, uh, are there charges made to the United States for for the cost and restoration of where those digs are done? So it, it depends. If we disturb a farmer's field, right, rice paddies, then yeah, we, we have to pay to restore. Um, but by comparison to what we're getting back, it's, 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 it's not a lot of money. So I guess I had to call it, but it's not, it's not a lot of money. And we, we do that around the world. It's just like when we, um, during wartime, right, when we destroy um, areas, we go back and either help them rebuild and or we, we pay money. Restoration. I can't be avoided. Good question. Yeah. I just want to ask something about DNA. I know it's relatively new. It's not, not relatively new, but it's new. But the percentage of DNA, how is it used versus uh, other types of identification for old, I mean, older World War II, Korea I. How does the, that type of DNA play in that, as far as percentage? Is it, is it a high percentage? You mean, what DNA? percentage of our cases do we use yeah. DNA? Yeah, DNA. Um, I don't actually know that number. We, we do a lot of DNA testing, and a lot of that is because some of this other, like maybe the historical data, is not as reliable, so we need verification, and we need to verify in a lot of cases. So often we'll have a good idea who it should be. So this is a good point, because I can use that, the case of Craig First Class Jones as an example, which by the way, is something when Bush was misspoken, it was me that knew it was him, but, so we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's this remains that were fairly complete, which a lot of them weren't. So we looked at him, he was really tall, we did the review, and from some characteristics of his teeth, we thought that it was an African American, and we measured a steamer, and we had like a, a, a number. So I said, I'm going to go back to my hotel room, I'm going to figure out, and tomorrow morning when I show up, I'm going to tell you who this is. So I estimated the guy's stature, I knew the box was supposed to be from the Wintown area, and I came up with three guys, just only three guys, who were this tall uh, African American descent in that area. And based on the unit, I was like, it's Jones, it's him, this is him. But we couldn't say that it was him without some other testing. So in that particular case, we used that DNA to confirm what we already suspected based on the location and the, the characteristics of the remains that led us to a name. But because, again, that recovery information wasn't reliable, it wasn't done. I mean, it turned out to be reliable, it was accurate, but we didn't have any way to put any faith in that because it was just told to us and we didn't know if those boxes were from recovered from where they they thought they thought they where they were told they were. Yeah. So in that case, it was the guy from that area, matched that profile, and we used that DNA to, con to confirm what we were seeing from other lines of evidence. So, so we use it a lot. But we also don't always get results because the DNA is degraded. A lot of these cases that come out of the disinterments, they've been treated with like formaldehyde powder and that degrades the, the DNA and the remains. So if we don't get DNA, um, we have to get creative and figure out some other ways to, to get to that uh, level where we feel confident that we know who it is. Can I just add something? Uh, the reference samples, what they need in the labs. Um, the new techniques, like she just mentioned, the formaldehyde, North Korea has been known to store their remains and only give them back to us when the price is right and they can get the most money out of us to get them. And this new, uh, new uh, next generation sequencing has overcome that formaldehyde problem. They're now able to get the DNA out of those remains. But they need the uh, they need the reference samples. If you have a uh, family member somewhere in the family, uh, they don't just need the maternal sample; it can be paternal, uh, and that's what they need. Yeah, if we don't have anything to compare it to, then if, even if the remains give us DNA information, we need something to compare it to. So before I forget. <coughs> 
Um, I want to make sure that everybody has a personal invitation to come to our lab in Hawaii. You've heard Dr. Keyes tell you a little bit, but you should experience, in, experience her and other scientists in the environment where they work. You'll be shocked and amazed. Uh, we do uh, tours of our lab all the time, so you're not inconveniencing us. You just have to reach out and ask for a tour, and our lab will be more than happy to take you through. And that's one lab. The other lab is in um, Nebraska, right, Patterson? So if you happen to be, I'm sorry, often. I'm sorry, often. Thank you. Uh, it's often. Uh, Nebraska. So if you happen to be passing through, please, please stop by. Is the trip paid for? I'm sorry? Is the trip paid for? It is. <laughs>